On today's show, we'll be talking about witches, demons, disembodied knocking, and much more. All coming up on this episode of Paranormal Mysteries. Welcome to the show, and thank you for joining me. I'm your host, Nick Ryan. I hope everyone had a great weekend. And before we start, I'd like to say thank you to Carlos, Katie, and Alex for their support and generosity. If you enjoy the show, please remember to subscribe, share, and review the podcast. This supports us by helping new listeners to discover the show. And if you'd like to support us even further by becoming a patron or by donating, please visit us at patreon.com slash paranormalmysteries or at buymeacoffee.com slash paranormal. These links and others can be found in the show notes. And if you've encountered the paranormal and would like to share your story, please email me at paranormalmysteriespodcast at gmail.com. All experiences, no matter how big or small, are always welcome. And with that in mind, our first story comes from Rianne, and Rianne's story is called The Story of My Wendigo. Rianne says, My story begins with my family history. My biological grandmother is Native American. Now, which tribe association, I have no idea. She also had a daughter, my mother, who was at one point a witch. On my father's side, my biological grandfather, I firmly believe, is associated with werewolves. He has an old journal full of werewolf information and sketches. On top of that, he goes hunting a lot and is a big deer hunter. It's also good to note that my grandfather on my mother's side has horrible mental illness and anger issues and horrid depression. Also just to note, my great-grandfather is German and my great-grandmother was from Argentina. My family history aside, I was raised around a witch. She was my landlord as a child and showed me the maypole dancing and rituals and Wiccan ways. I dabbled in good energy channeling and praying with crystals to the universe. But as a teenager, I did some not-so-great things to a few people. I hurt partners physically, and as I grew up, that sort of haunted me, and I became really depressed. I wanted to die, and I attracted a lot of really bad energy. Eventually, I attracted what I believed to be a Wendigo. After listening to the stories of them, this is what I firmly believe. I hear the mimics of voices, and I always feel like I'm being watched from the edge of the woods by my apartment complex. Just the energy I feel feels like a wendigo. Something just spells it out for me. Our next story of the night comes from Maya, and Maya's story is called Weird and Scary Experiences. Maya says, I have a few experiences. One started when I was about nine years old. I was living in my family's house in Hawthorne, California in 1992. I fell asleep on the living room couch one day. I don't know if I was dreaming or if it was an out-of-body experience, but I was up in the air watching myself sleep, and I could see a huge dark figure standing in front of me, watching me sleep as well. My body on the couch could not move or speak, but could feel a presence. Later on, throughout my twenties, when I was living on my own in Los Angeles, I had a few more experiences. I was living in a two-bedroom house on top of four small garages. There was an alley right behind my house. A lot of things happened in that alley. I even witnessed a murder in that alley one year. I am a single mother with a daughter who was a child at the time, but due to my law enforcement work schedule, she would stay at my parents' house until my off days, so I was alone most of the time. On multiple occasions while sleeping, I would hear footsteps coming down the hall and into my bedroom. I would then feel the unoccupied side of my bed sink down, as if someone got into bed with me. It would never touch me or move anything. It just felt like it got into bed and watched me. I would be paralyzed and wouldn't be able to move or scream. I would just pray over and over in my head until it would go away. I would then be able to wake up and look around only to see that nothing was there. After experiencing this, I started taking a number of pills, Ambien, muscle relaxers, etc., that would literally knock me out cold all night so that I could avoid it. I know it's not good, and I haven't done it since it all stopped. 
My daughter's room was so close to mine that we could see each other while we were both laying in our own beds. One day my daughter told me, when we were both in my house, she woke up in the middle of the night and saw a dark figure on all fours, crouching on her ceiling, looking at her. She began to pray. When she opened her eyes again, she said that the creature had turned to crawl into my room, still crawling on the ceiling. I never woke up and never saw the thing. One of my last experiences was the scariest one. I was on a seven-day cruise throughout Mexico. I never sleep on my back, one, because it hurts, and two, because it gives me a feeling of vulnerability. I was in bed with my ex-boyfriend in our room on the cruise ship, and he was asleep. I was sleeping, but was then startled by a four-legged, scaly creature with a tail, pointed ears, red eyes, and a snout. It was standing on my chest, with its tongue going into my mouth and I could hear a deep, raspy whisper. I don't know what it was saying, but it wasn't a recognizable language. I got up crying hysterically. When I got back home, I told my co-worker, and he said it was probably because I was in Mexican waters, and it may have been El Duende. I googled El Duende and looked at the images, and I saw the creature that was standing on my chest. Lastly, my daughter is a classical pianist, Her piano teacher took a trip to Jerusalem one year. I never told the piano teacher about our experiences, but when she returned, she gave me three vials, one with holy water, one with holy oil, and one with holy soil. I haven't had any experiences since, except for one. I fell asleep on my couch, and as soon as I got into a deep sleep, I heard running up my hallway, and then something jumped onto my chest again. I'm not sure if it was the gift from Jerusalem that stopped those experiences, or if it was getting out of a bad relationship, or maybe both. I've always wondered if it was possible that a bad relationship could conjure up a negative energy. Does anyone else think so? Thank you for sharing. Maya Our next story of the night comes from Enid, and Enid's story is called Ouija Board Experience. Enid says, Hello, Nick. I have a story from my mom and how she and her cousins messed with a Ouija board and contacted something evil. It was 12 a.m. on a calm June night, and my mom and her three cousins were outside, telling creepy stories around a bonfire because my nana wasn't home, and her siblings were staying with my grandpa for the week. They were just talking and messing around when her cousin Benny pulled out a Ouija board from his backpack and said that they should contact some demons. My mom is a very superstitious person and was raised by my nana, who always told my mom to stay away from doorways to demons and spirits, so she really didn't want to participate in it. She was about to go inside and go watch some movies when her cousin started teasing her and calling her a chicken. She got annoyed and decided that she would play with the board no matter how uneasy she felt. They got a small table from the garage, set up the board, and began to play. It started with my mom's cousin Connie asking if anyone was there with them, to no answer. They kept asking the board various questions, like when and how they would die, or if there were any spirits in the house, and still, no answer. Benny got annoyed and started cursing at the board in Spanish. Soon after, they all got bored and took their hands off the planchette so they could put the board away, when all the dogs in the neighborhood started to howl at the same time including my Uncle Mario's dog, Foxy, who was in the house, howling by the door. The trees began to violently shake soon after, even though there was no previous wind that night. Then they heard banging in the house, so my mom went to go see what it was, and when she went in, she saw the cabinets, fridge door, bathroom door, Foxy's cage, and all the bedroom doors were violently opening and shutting, over and over again. She went back outside and began to hear voices calling her name over and over again, and soon after the event, learned that her cousins also heard their own names being called by voices as well. My mom's cousin Coco started to cry and began to pray out loud. They all soon followed and began praying with Coco. Benny then threw the board in the bonfire, and everything soon stopped. They ran inside and locked all the doors and windows and then stayed up all night watching TV in the living room, afraid to walk home or even go to sleep. When my nana got home, they told her what they had done, and she was extremely mad and disappointed in them. 
She sent Benny, Coco, and Connie home and prayed over the house. Afterwards, there was no more activity in the house, and my mom and her cousins have never touched a Ouija board since. Thanks for reading. Our next story comes from Courtney, and Courtney's story is called Late Night Knocking. Courtney says, Like many of your readers, I recently stumbled across your podcast and have been hooked. For as long as I can remember, I have been very drawn to the paranormal. I love scary movies, Halloween, and any good ghost story, but not just for the good adrenaline rush. I am genuinely intrigued by it. I was very reluctant to write in and share my experiences, but like most people, my experiences have been ridiculed or even discounted by others throughout my life. Until now, I haven't had a forum to feel comfortable telling others what I have experienced. My deciding factor to write in came last night while listening to an older podcast where a couple recounted their time slip experience. The writer mentioned the city that they were traveling from, which happened to be the name of the town I grew up in, Forney, but I was certain it wasn't my Forney. When the author gave the name of the neighboring town, I literally shouted out in my car because it was my Forney. As odd as it seems, this made me feel like it was my sign to be comfortable enough to share. So here goes. My family moved to Forney when I was in the second or third grade, which was in the late 80s or early 90s. The house we moved into was one of the historical homes in the area built in 1908 by the town doctor. Like most doctors in that time, he lived and worked out of the same structure. I don't recall having experiences when I was younger, at least none that stick out, but from age 10 on is when that changed for me. I grew up in a single-parent household with my mother, younger sister, and me. We were very close. However, my mom and sister did not share the same curiosity as I did with the paranormal. In fact, it was quite the opposite. While I have many encounters I could share that happened in this house and continuing throughout my life, I wanted to start with one that involved more than just me. Since my mom was the sole provider, she had several jobs, which often left me in charge of caring for my younger sister. I didn't get much time to myself, but when I did, stuff happened. The first time that it occurred, my mom and sister had gone to my grandma's house for the night while I was left at home to finish some chores. I was in the living room folding clothes and watching TV when all of a sudden, someone began banging on the back door. This wasn't just a knocking. It was so loud and aggressive that I expected to see the door buckling inward as I approached. Bang, 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 over and over, without stopping. I thought something had happened or someone was in trouble, so I sprinted to the back door. Just as I put my hand on the doorknob, it stopped and moved to the front door. It was an immediate change, as if someone was standing at both the back and front door and had coordinated what I thought to be a prank. The layout of the house was pretty open, so while standing at the back door, I could see a clear path to the front door. The porch light was on, and I didn't see any shadow of someone through the front door glass, which I should have. The door was old, and the deadbolt was an antique, solid and sturdy metal latch that you would fasten from the frame of the door itself. The banging was just as aggressive on the front door as was on the back, and I was sure that the latch was going to break. I sprinted to the front door again, and as soon as I put my hand on the doorknob, it stopped and went to the back door again. By the time I reached the back door the second time, the banging stopped. I have to admit I was a little miffed about this. I yanked the back door open, about to give someone a piece of my mind, but no one was there. I walked outside and around the house, because surely I should have seen the pranksters, but there was no one. In fact, it was eerily quiet. Not really knowing what to do with that, I went back inside, locked the doors, and went about finishing my chores. Soon after, a pattern developed. This event would happen every single time I was left by myself, and would start at 10.20 p.m. Back door, then front door, then back door, then it would stop. No one was ever there. I tried to debunk or outsmart it, and the next time I was alone, I would watch the clock, and when it was close to 10.20... I would wait in the back room for it to begin, but it didn't. It's like it knew that I was trying to catch it, so it would hide or something. I kept this to myself 
because I was so used to being told that I was making things up with my crazy imagination, or just not believed at all. Until one day my sister, who was four years younger than me, sheepishly asked me if things happened when I was at home alone. She wouldn't look me in the eyes while asking me, like she was embarrassed to even bring it up. Turns out, she was experiencing the same late-night knocking that I was when she was alone. It would occur at the back door, front door, then back door, and then stop. This went on for about three years, and I had gotten used to it and would just ignore it while it was happening. Fast forward, I was now in high school and working a part-time job. My sister was at home with a friend, and my mom was also at work. I received a call at work from my sister, who was absolutely hysterical. She was screaming and crying and just said, Get home, it's happening, it's happening. There's blood, there's blood. I rushed home to find my sister crying uncontrollably in her bedroom with sheer terror on her face and her friend sitting on the edge of the bed, just staring off in like a shocked or comatose state. When my sister finally calmed down, she told me that at 10.20 p.m., the banging started on the back door. It took her by surprise, because this time she was not alone, so she knew something was different. She said that the banging seemed louder and more aggressive than before, and in efforts to calm down her friend, my sister went through the motions of trying to answer the door. It went from back door to front door to back door, but here is where it changed. On the last round at the back door, my sister said that she approached the door, and she heard a loud pop, like a gunshot. When she opened the door, no one was there, and on the concrete porch and down the steps was a puddle of red liquid that she thought was blood. She slammed the door and called me. When I went to inspect the back porch, there was nothing there. No signs of any blood or other liquid anywhere, and even more curious, after this finale, we never experienced the knocking again. Over the years, I have tried to research and find a reason or explanation for our experiences but I have not been able to find answers. My sister's friend would never speak of this again, almost like she blocked it out of her memory, and my sister now denies that it happened. I think that is her way of coping with it. Sorry this is long. I just couldn't fully describe what happened in short sentences. Thanks for your hard work, and know that we appreciate you and the community you have built for us. Courtney Our next story comes from Dana. Dana's story is called, Until We Meet Again. Dana says, My brother passed away almost five years ago of leukemia. It broke my heart. I didn't get a chance to say goodbye. It was one of many deaths in my family. After my big brother passed away, I had a really hard time dealing with it. We were best friends. Shortly after his passing, I went back to work, and I was battling work and a deep depression. I left work and came home, and I napped on the sofa. I felt the cushion dip down behind me, as if someone laid down behind me. Being half asleep and very groggy, I thought it was my partner. I then felt a hand on my arm, and a soothing touch. I then turned over expecting to see my partner, but it was my brother. He was looking right at me, and he looked healthy and so real. He spoke to me. He said, Hi, little sis. I just want you to know that I'm okay, and I see that you are hurting. I know that you love me and that you miss me. Know that I am doing well. He was so thin and frail when he passed, and here he was healthy and normal. He was wearing a shirt that I gave him for Christmas. He told me that he loves me and that we will see each other again. I then woke up crying and shaking so bad. My partner walked in the room, and when I told her, she said that I needed to hear that. I have had several experiences, and they are all very different, but I thought it would be nice to share this one. Thank you for all that you do. Dana Our next story comes from Lisa. Lisa's story is called The Strange Apartment. Lisa says, My mother, sister, and I moved into a two-flat my sophomore year in high school. The place was roomy but gloomy, and a back bedroom was always freezing cold, no matter what the season. A few odd things happened in that apartment. We had been living there for about two weeks and had yet to get the key to the basement. I had left a school book on the fireplace mantel one evening, and the next day it was gone. 
I searched high and low, and I couldn't find it until we got the keys to the basement. And there was the book in the basement. My mom had a thing about us closing the bedroom and bathroom doors before leaving the apartment for the day. One day, I was the last one out of the house, and I closed the two bedroom doors and bathroom door before leaving. Later that afternoon, I was the first one home. I opened the front door, and the first thing I heard was the sound of three doors slamming shut, one after another. I closed the front door, went inside, and waited for my mom and sister to come home. Our first few months in that apartment, we had a little rescue dog. She kept running away, even though she was as spoiled as a princess. She finally met her end when she ran into a city bus, and I wonder whether the strange entity in the house drove her away. As we come to the end of tonight's episode, I'd like to thank all of you for tuning in, and a special thank you goes out to Rianne, Maya, Enid, Courtney, Dana, and Lisa for sharing their experiences. If you've witnessed something that you can't explain, please contact me at paranormalmysteriespodcast at gmail.com or visit us at paranormalmysteriespodcast.com and click on the Tell Your Story link. All of our contact information can be found in the show notes. Until next time, I hope you all have a safe and healthy beginning to your week, and we'll see you back here on Wednesday with our next episode. From everyone at Paranormal Mysteries, thank you for listening, and remember, don't wait for the unknown to come to you. Get out there and find it.